You ready for the word tonight? Good. Well, while you're still giving, let's do it. Anointing, that's what we're talking about tonight, and particularly the focus is going to be for generational blessing. But I want to talk about anointing, and then when I lay hands on you, here's what I want you to believe. I want you to trust God for this, not only for you to receive this kind of grace or touch or impartation, maybe it's healing for you, whatever it is that this anointing moment will bring unto you, but I want you to believe for that to also enter your household, for it to pass from generation to generation to generation. I've told people that if trouble can pass from generation to generation, then why can't blessing? Come on, really, why can't, why would we think that only the devil could boost things in people's life that would go generationally? How about this? How about the, the grace of God, the power of God, the moving of the Holy Spirit, the touch of heaven upon our house? That's what we're trusting God for. But, but as we come to this point of, of anointing, I know for a lot of people, uh, they may be saying, well, this is really nice, but so you're going you're gonna to slap oil in my face? You're going to pray with me? Well, what exactly is anointing about? Well, there's a subject that it could take us the rest of our lifetime to exhaust, but let me show you a few things tonight that I'm going to say that anointing accomplishes within people. The first one's going to be taken from the ministry of Jesus in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. The setting that you have when we come to the 18th verse is that uh, Jesus has already been water baptized. He's already been identified from the heavens. Now this is my beloved son. He has already gone into the wilderness and spent uh, 40 days and nights in fasting and prayer and fellowship with the Father. And also you have that moment of the rebuttal of the enemy. He comes out of that wilderness experience and it is right fresh after having dealt with the devil. And I, I, I'm not going to, it's not in the part we're reading, but it's there within the setting. And it always captivates me because as Jesus came out ha after having dealt with the devil, the Bible says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. I like that. I like that in every way, but especially within the context of the setting, because most Christians, when you hear about them having dealt with the demonic in any form or way, it's like they are wore out. They come in just kind of dragging, oh man, the devil's been on my case all week, pray for me that I can make it. But gee, the Bible says that after this battle went on, it was the devil that was going out of there saying, oh man, I had to deal with Jesus this week, you all need to pray for me, you know, because Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. I got to tell you, if there's nobody saved where, you're, where you work and, and, and it just seems to be a hellhole in that place, here's what I think. I think when you walk in there tomorrow morning, you should give the devil hives. Well, he comes out of there and he stands up to preach. It's the first time he'll preach a public message that we have any record of. And he'll say this. And I'm just going to read a part of the 18th verse because I've got much more that I want to deal with. Well, I'm going to take the part that I'm going to focus on. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too. And that's all I'm going to read. There's a lot more there, but that's all I'm going to read. And then he lists really is basically his mission statement. But here's what I want to focus on. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me too. You know what I'm, what I'm going to tell you about anointing? I'm going to tell you that anointing empowers. And anointing empowers you unto fruitfulness. It, it empowers you unto purpose. And I, I understand that in the dimension of anointing, especially for those of us that are parts of churches that get it. Now, there are some churches that don't even talk about anointing. And that may be because... Uh, moving right along. But those of us that have experienced anointing understand that it can affect you at every level of your makeup, spirit, soul, and body. All right, and so many times there is that moment in anointing flow that affects this body in marvelous 
and sometimes unusual ways. Now, because of that, some only focus on that dimension because it's visible. It's right there. And then they say, That's, there it is. Boy, they got, can you look at them? They got the anointing on them. And it's true. They do. But the anointing is for more. Hello? It's for more. I didn't say that wasn't valid. I'm sure not saying it wasn't real, because it is. But it's for more. It's for more than a euphoric moment. It's for more than a buzz. It's for more than a shout. And let me explain to you that I want to shout. And I like a buzz. And I like the fly high. If you want to be dull, you're in the wrong place. I used to say, when I pastored my last church, which was on the property of Brother Schambach, I used to say to the church this. I said, the Lord has delivered us from boring church. <laughs> I think that's true of this house for sure. But yet the anointing, while it does all those things I just spoke of, is there for the purpose of empowerment, for accomplishment. And so Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me too. Wow. Can I tell you that your anointing will be strongest, not exclusive, but it will be strongest in keeping with the divine design for your life. So you're anointed largely, predominantly, to be who you are. Sometimes in Christianity, we think that anointings are like a spiritual buffet line. You know, where you walk down through there and say, I would like one of those. I'll take two of that. And that thing over there, that's never getting on my plate. I can tell you that right now. As if we will just hunt and pick. And so we look at those that we like. We say, I want that anointing. And I'll take a double portion of that one over here. And then I disdain this other anointing because it doesn't fit my style. We don't say it that way, but that's what it amounts to. But here's the truth of the matter. When you got born of the Spirit, you didn't just guess the right religion. You didn't just say the right prayer. If you're really born from above, then the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead came into you. And Peter describes it in part one way. He says, we're born again, not of corruptible seed. Someone say seed. Uh, all right. Uh, but an incorruptible seed by the word of God. And that's a person, not a sermon. Which lives and abides forever. Let me tell you, when you get say what happens to you, the DNA of God is planted within you. You come alive. That, that portion of you which was dead spiritually comes alive in that moment as he puts his life within you. And you understand something about the DNA of an individual that carries the characteristics of who that person will be. Even personality is in there. Hair color will be in there. How long that hair will stay will be in there. All right? Height, all the rest, all that. You get this, don't you? You, you understand what I'm saying. And... And in that is the ability to function. Let me tell you, when you got filled with his spirit, he is your anointing. Do you understand that? And, and, in, and, he, and he anoints you predominantly to be who you are. You need to understand your spiritual purpose. Let me say it to you also like this. You, you, need, you, need, to, you need to know who you are. You need to love who you are. Quit disdaining your anointing and pining for another. You need to embrace who you are and you need to love who you are because that's where you will be most fruitful. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too. Just remember, when we talk about anointing, 
when we speak of anointing, when we lay hands on you unto anointing, it's for empowerment. It's for empowerment. You should get something tonight that'll shake you to the bone, but you should walk out that door and shake this world. There's another thing that anointing does, and you'll find that in another familiar scripture, James 5 and verse 14 and 15, and it'll tell you there that the anointing heals. The writer says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him. Someone say anointing him. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Well, I like how positive that is. And the Lord shall raise him up. Look at this last part. And if he's committed sins, well, he's all washed up, maybe. Doesn't say that, does it? They shall be forgiven him. Isn't that wonderful? Even sin can't stop you from being healed. Did you hear that? Juan, if you will embrace his forgiveness. All right, look at it again with me. Is there any sick among you? I, I, can't, ever, I, I can't ever read this scripture, and I know it's really not in keeping with the the point I'm trying to make, but I like it so much I'm going to say it anyhow. I can't ever read this scripture, but what that sentence grabs me. Is there any sick among you? And I thought, oh God, I long for the day to be a part of a church where you have to ask if there's anybody left sick. How about that? I mean, if there's any question at all, he had no question about whether God would heal. He had no question about whether God would perform. The only question he had is, is, there, is it even possible that anybody is left sick? Man, how about that? My mentor, one of the old voice of healing guys, he used to say it, and he was being humorous, tongue-in-cheek, but he would say this, and his meetings would go along. The first meeting I met him in went 17 weeks. But he would say, by the time this crusade is over, you're either going to be healed or ashamed to say you're sick. <laughs> but let's get back on target. The anointing, what does it do? It heals. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and then the Lord shall raise him up. What's the difference? What is the difference between the guy getting prayed for and anointed, but yet walking out sick, and the guy who walks out well? I can tell you the difference. It's anointing. Just putting the oil on, just saying the prayer, just getting people around that are well-meaning and sympathetic aren't going to change the course of one's health. But when anointing is flowing, people get healed. Are you catching that? When anointing is flowing, people don't just get prayed for. They get healed. That anointing is of him. Sure, it may flow through us, but I will tell you, it is of him. It is not of this flesh. And I say this, and it may sound like a crack at being humble, but it's not. It's just a reality. That whenever I see the great miracles of God, I try to act cool. I believe that. I know all about that. But the truth of the matter is, whenever I see these great miracles of God, I'm on the inside like everybody else saying, did you see that? This past summer, in our East African Crusades, we had four people that were in the audience, not all at the same time, it was actually two different countries, but four people that were born deaf mutes that were healed by the power of God. And some of them were adults. 
that had never heard and never spoken. What an amazing moment. In Mombasa, Kenya, about three years ago, we had, we had three in one weekend. We had a child that was brought to the stage. And you've got to understand, in those huge crowds like that, you have to have strong, loud audio. If the audio it can't be heard clearly for two kilometers, you're wasting your time, because that's what actually draws the crowd. And so it's quite a volume. I, many times I will wear earplugs on the stage, because it's nearly deafening loud that's up there for those kind of crowds to be able to hear the message that's being delivered. And I, as many of you know, the people normally get healed while I'm actually preaching. Jesus is doing those things right out in the crowd, and so we have them. In America, at the end of a service, I have people come up to tell what they got healed of, but in Africa, I, I tell the folks, as soon as you get a miracle, come up and we have Africans train, and, and if I bring some folks to America, we train them to do the same, and they work right among the crowd or right in the front, and I tell them, this is, if you're out there and, and you had a deaf ear and open up or a blind eye, you see, or you had a stroke and you can move your arm or your leg again, come up and tell one, right while I'm speaking, just come right up and tell one of these people, and then what they do is they vet them, they, 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 they're taught, ask three questions, number one, what did you get, and then they have to prove that they got it. All right, and number two, who did it? Because we don't need anybody going up there saying Allah did it or, some, or something else like that, all right? So they have, to, uh, they have to recognize that it was Jesus that healed them. And then the third question they ask is, is, uh, is, is he now your Lord? And many of them will come right to the point of conversion right at that point, all right? And then after that's been done, they bring them to the stage, and we have chairs for them, and they, they will sit there, they will wait until I'm through preaching. When I'm through preaching, then we will turn and say, well, we've heard his word. He's confirmed his word with signs following. So now that you've heard the word, let's see what he's done. And when, after they hear the testimony of the Lord, then we call them to the point of repentance. We don't call them to the point of repentance before. The word is both spoken and demonstrated. You get where we're going on this. So here I am in Mobasa, Kenya now, and it, the stage is very loud. I, I have just finished preaching. My interpreter, who's been with me for years now, is, knows what to do, so I don't have to tell him or walk him through it. I just step back. I say, Timothy, you know what to do. And his job is to get everybody from the fringes as close as can be as we're about to hear the testimonies. And I always step back to determine what in the world we've got. And I looked over, and I saw people sitting on the seats, and they had crutches in their hands. I understood, and braces. And I realized now these are people that are healed. You could look at them and know what you're about to testify. But, but the main guy that helped, helps me do all of my Kenyan crusades, he was holding a nine-year-old girl. Next to him was the girl's mother who was weeping profusely, and I never did see her where she was not weeping. But I looked at the girl. I could not see anything wrong with her at all or, or any indication of anything having been wrong. And I said to him, Bishop Mike, what, did, what do we have here? And he said to me, now you remember it's very loud, which if you have a hearing problem to begin with, you're going to struggle just communicating. You, almost, you have to shout at each other. And I said, what in the world do we have here? He said, this young girl was born deaf and dumb. He said, she's never heard and she's never spoken. While she was out in the crowd, Jesus healed her. And she looked up at her mother and said, Mommy, for the very first time, that's why she's crying profusely here right now. And when he said that, is I'm looking at the little girl now that he's holding. I mean, what can you say? And so when he said that, I said, wow. And she looked at me and went, wow. And I said, wow. And she went, wow. And I said, wow. And she went, wow. I said, okay, we got to stop that. <laughs> and in moments like that, let me explain something to you. Nobody in the crowd... Nobody in the room knows more than me that it wasn't me. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm telling you the truth. In a moment when you see things like that, you realize the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he, 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 he has anointed And these things happen, and the sick get healed, not because we're hot dogs, not because our theology is better than everybody else in town, not because we can say the words with the right vibration in Jesus' name, but because the anointing brings forth healing. Let me tell you another thing the anointing does. Isaiah 10 and verse 27 now, this is a passage, and I'm, again, I'm just going to take a portion of it. 
and it's the portion that we usually quote, but we quote it in jest. We don't actually quote it the way it's written. We usually say something like this, that the, uh, the anointing breaks the yoke. But the scripture actually reads this way, that the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. I like that. I'm going to tell you that the anointing, what does it do? What does it do? Oh, good night. It doesn't give you a self-help moment. It doesn't help you tolerate the rest of the day. And it doesn't even, and I'm not going to go into, and some people get all wound up about terminology, and I'm, I'm not going to go deep down that road, but I'm going to suggest something to you. If, if my wife says, you all know Max. If my wife says, Max has broken something, the first thing I'm thinking is, all right, let me see it because we can fix that. But if she says to me, Max has destroyed something, I realize that one's all over, baby. Yeah, throw it away. And, and I want to talk to you about an anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. That doesn't leave the addict, the alcoholic, the cutter the bulimic, with an identity for life that I am a recovering whatever. But one that enters in and so transforms an individual that they never have that identity or that hook or that draw anymore. I'm talking about a yoke-destroying anointing. How about this? How about an anointing that doesn't just help you pay your mortgage this month, but destroys poverty in your household? How about an anointing that doesn't just let you sleep better tonight, but are you listening to me? It delivers you from all fear. A yoke destroying anointing. That's what anointing does. Oh, come on. First John 2 and verse 27 brings us to another truth about anointing. I like this one. And that is that the anointing abides. There's more to the verse, but that's where we'll center in. But the anointing which you've received of him abides in you. You need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and his truth, and is no lie, even it has taught you, you shall abide. Someone say abide in him. The anointing that you've received of him abides in you. Can I encourage you in this way? While the anointing is feelable, it is also present when you're not cognizant of it. Now that was worth the whole night. You need to believe that. Because there are times that we're very cognizant of the anointing. We sense it, we're alert to it, whether it's a spiritual alertness, whether it's physically, because it can be recognized that way too. But I need to encourage you to understand, if the anointing you've received of him doesn't go when you don't feel it, it is not absent when you're not aware of it. It's within your spiritual DNA for you to be who you are and to function within the divine design of your life. All you have to do is step out on that, and you'll find that anointing is right there to accomplish that. You need to learn to act in keeping with who you are in Christ, even when you don't sense anointing, because you actually have it. You've always got more than you know. And you are more than what you realize. Sometimes you've got to step out of the boat just to find out you can walk on the water. You can't test it in a swimming pool first. You just got to do it. I can tell you, there are times, and 
There, there are times, and listen, anyone that's in this room that's functioned in any level of consistent ministry, I'm not talking about those who sing, but they only come in and do it on a special. Or those that teach, they do teach, and they teach well, but they're not, they don't have a, they don't have to do it every week. They don't have to do it every week. You know, they, they do it on occasion. I'm not saying they're lesser people, but they may not quite understand what I'm saying. Those of us that we have to be up here every week, a couple of times more a week, here's what you find out. You'll find out that there are times you're really red hot and ready to go with it, and there are other times you're not. And sometimes you don't even feel good. Are you hearing me? But anybody that's ever done this will have this testimony. I came in here weak. Maybe came in here fevered. Maybe came in here in pain. But somehow when I stood up to do what I was designed to do, there was no more pain. Then there was no more weakness. Did you all hear what I'm talking about? You might not know that if you only do it once in a while because you might not have to do it when you don't feel like it. But when you're stuck doing it all the time, you're going to realize that you're going to, you're, going to, you're going to do it sometimes when you're at the top of your game, and you're going to have to do it sometimes when you're kind of middle ways there, and sometimes you have to drag yourself out of the bed and slap yourself in the face and say, you're going to do it. But when you step in there, once again, that more than me anointing comes upon you. That empowerment that is not from this man, but is from above, and has dwells now within, rises up. Are you listening to me? And it rises up, my God, like an artesian well. That, that without force or pumping, something stands up on the inside. And I have strength that I did not know before. But it was there all along because this anointing didn't fly the coop. Because I was tired, weak, hungry, or whatever it might be, the anointing abides. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, here's the deal. There will be big times of your life, large spans of your life where you will be barren and unfruitful. And those will be the times that you're sitting around waiting for the anointing to come. But it's actually always there. We don't like what I'm about to say, but what we're really doing, we say, well, we got to get in the spirit, but what we're really doing is we got to get in the mood. Handle it, buddy, because we've already taken the offering and I'm not giving it back. The anointing. Just some truths about this thing. It abides. It abides. It's always there. It's there in the high time in a wonderful service like this, and it's there in the middle of the night when your child is crying and fevered in that bedroom when you walk in and there's no saints to join hands with and there's no band in the background. You can count on the anointing of God. You can count on the anointing of God. Are you hearing me? You can count on the anointing of God. I have way more confidence in his anointing than I do in me. I have more confidence in his anointing to succeed than, than my ability to fail. All right, let me, let me give you one last one. And I, I won't even read it because I didn't bring my timer up here. It tells me how long I've been preaching. And so I've already told myself it's only been 10 minutes. but I don't know how long it's been, so I'll just give you the biblical passage and I'll comment on it because I really do want to have time to lay hands on you tonight with this anointing oil. Another thing that the anointing does is that it consecrates. The anointing consecrates. Now, there again is not a common term in our present vocabulary. So what does consecration mean? Well, dear God, that's a whole night in itself. But in Leviticus 21, in verse 10 through 13, you understand the moment of anointing unto consecration. And what it will tell you is that anointing oil will mark you as holy. Did you hear what I said? Consecrate means to mark, 
and to separate, to plainly identify and, and bring aside consecration. You see now in just a few moments, Pastor Al and I are going to do this together. We're going to come up a line up this middle area, and uh, he's going he's to slap some oil on you. You got some oil over here? All right. Oh, let's see what you got. All right. All right. Good. He's got it. And he's going to put that oil on you. And when you put the oil on, I don't want you to give him a bro cream anointing. You know, that little dab will do you. Just go ahead and do a little wipe like that. Because I want to see the word anointing means to smear. So what's going to happen is he's going to put enough oil on you that after I pray with you and you go on down, he's going to hit you with the oil and I'm going to hit you with the fist, another hand of faith. And if someone's sitting yet in the seat there and wasn't really watching maybe what went on, they see you coming down the aisle, uh, they're not going to have to say, oh, oh, did he get anointed? They're going to look at you and they're going to see enough of that, right? They're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he got that, yeah. He, he's been anointed, you know. But, it, but at some point tonight, and maybe almost very quickly, you'll wipe that off. Now, don't baptize them in the oil, okay? Some of them got pretty clothes on. Yeah, yeah, we know. Just, but, but you'll wipe that off. But here's what I believe, and I know people say this is symbolic, and, and to a degree it is, but here's what I also believe. I don't believe there's anything that we do in obedience to the word of the Lord that is only or purely symbolic. I believe there's also something going on in the spirit at that same time. And while we may put this oil on you that you will wipe off, there is another one that is putting his oil upon you, and you will not wipe that off with the tissue. And just like people in this house, before you wipe it off, may look at you when you go down that aisle and say, yes, I can see she's got that oil on her. When you walk out of this door, now you're going to have to understand what I'm saying here. There are those that will see that mark on you. Because amongst many things, it's a mark of consecration. And when you walk into that hospital room, that mark will be on you, which is that mark of anointing that carries healing. And if there's demonic oppression that has brought that person into that illness, those devils will see that too. The minute you walk, the minute you walk in that room, you're going to take one look, and they'll see that mark of consecration right there. And they'll know this is going to be a bad day for them. Before you ever open your mouth or open that word, anointing consecrates. It empowers. Come on. It heals. It destroys. My God. It destroys the yoke of bondage. It abides. And it marks you under consecration. By the way, since the consecration is there, don't desecrate it. Since your hands are holy, keep them in holy places. You understand what I just said? Since your eyes are holy, focus on holy things. Since your ears are holy, don't let them become dumpsters. Don't let consecration be shamed. Walk in that holiness that God has given unto you by abundance of grace and empowerment of the Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the room?